Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Bart Shepard. I'm the director of the Steinhardt Aquarium at the California Academy of Sciences. And I, with Luis uh, and Terry and many, many other people, work on our Hope for Reefs initiative, which is our initiative focused on coral reefs. I'm going to kick us off. And we're going to do a little round robin and hope everything goes as smoothly as it can. So first of all, we thought we'd just give you a little bit of context. This is our building, the California Academy of Sciences. It's in Golden Gate Park. Uh, pretty much right in the center of San Francisco. And it's a relatively new building. We moved in there in 2008, uh, but it's we're an old organization. We've been around since the 1800s. Uh, we were founded by a group of mostly gentlemen, uh, very few women who came to San Francisco right after the, in the times of the gold rush, when people were making a lot of money in, in California because of the gold rush. And there were folks that recognized new biodiversity and this different sort of world that existed in the coast of, of Western United States. And so they formed this Society of Naturalists, this California Academy of Sciences to document that. And that goes back you know, to the 1860s or so. Um, we've been in this location in Golden Gate Park uh, since about 1913. Uh, and, um, the Steinhardt Aquarium that I'm the director of will celebrate our 100th year next year. So we've been on this location uh, since 1923. So a relatively long time. Uh, we're a, a aquarium, a science museum, a research and education institution. We have a planetarium. And our mission is to regenerate the natural world through science, learning, and collaboration. And what we mean by that, regenerate, uh, is to really uh, reconnect people with nature and help people understand better that we are all a part of nature. We're not this separate thing that's observing and, and living with nature, but we're actually uh, intricately connected with nature, kind of part of nature. Uh, and then that also uh, regeneration is beyond sustainability, right? That we've moved to a point with the planet that sustainability is not good enough, that we actively actually have to go out and heal the planet and put ecosystems and biodiversity and things back on track uh, to be a, a more healthy, prosperous future. And that's um, part of what you know we're seeing here with some of the work that the Rotem Marine Park is starting to do with coral restoration. That's exactly what we're talking about. This kind of work where we're, we're helping improve the ecosystem and leaving it better than what we found where we found. We have three main initiatives that we are using uh, to pursue our mission or to, to achieve our mission. Uh, the one that we'll talk about mostly tonight is Hope for Reefs, but the two others, uh, Islands 2030, that's really focused on terrestrial biodiversity and the island chains around the world, places like the Galapagos and the Netherlands and Tilly's and Madagascar, places like that. And then, of course, we are based in California, so we have a California initiative, Thriving California, that is looking to do many similar things. There's a lot of like community science and like getting people out in nature, um, looking at biodiversity, documenting biodiversity, again, trying to build those connections between people and nature, uh, and, and then through environmental learning and through collaboration. And collaboration is a huge part of what we do. We're a relatively small organization. We can't achieve all of this by ourselves, and we know that. So we're looking to build partnerships uh, in places where we are working and, and with Hope for Reefs, that's no exception. And so we're, we're very excited about the potential for partnerships with Roatan Marine Park and with others here in Roatan. It's um, you know, a wonderful place for us to come to. We've seen some amazing things that we'll talk about uh, tonight. And we really think that there's a, a, a great future, uh, a potential for partnerships here um, in the long term. All right. All right, thanks, Bart. Um, so I'm Luis Rocha. I'm a curator of ecology and co-director together with Bart. Uh, I can do it. Okay, you can do it. Thank you. Um, co-director, yes, of the Hope for Reefs Initiative. Um, so mesophotic coral ecosystems, what are they? Where are they? They are everywhere, um, but people don't know about them because they're very hard to reach. Um, so if you're a, a recreational scuba diver, which I assume most of you are, you know that uh, you can't really go much deeper than 45 meters or so with the, the recreational diving training. The gases we breathe don't allow us to go much deeper than 45 meters, so we stay on that top. And that's where the scientists stay also, because they were usually when you're doing science, you want to be marine biologists, you want to study a coral reef, you do an 
pulpits, you can uh, uh, scuba diving training, you were allowed to go to about 40, 45 minute, meters max. Um, so before that reason, almost everything we know about coral reefs comes from this, this top portion there. So from the shallow coral reefs. But there is a lot more coral reefs below that that very few people know about. Um, those coral reefs, they're really special because they're very different from the deep sea because they still have a lot of the same complexity and the same structure that you, we see on shallow coral reefs. So uh, uh, if you study geology or oceanography before, you know that this, the earth goes through glacial cycles. So in the cold, the cold period, right now we're in a warm period, we're in an interglacial. So the temperatures are warm and the sea level is high. When we're in a glacial period that's colder, the temperature drops and the sea level drops because the water gets captured in the glaciers. So when the sea level is lower, the sea level, instead of being here, it's here. So the reef grows here. Now, because the reef grows there, when the sea level is lower, the corals go there. So that so all of the complexity that we see in the shallow reef here, it's also on the deep reef because it was built when the sea level was lower. When the sea level goes up, most of those corals that live on that depth, they, they, they die because they, it gets too dark and too cold for them, but they leave their skeletons behind, so they leave their structure, the complexity, and the places for small fish and invertebrates to hide and their whole ecosystem uh, uh, to thrive on that depth. So it's much more diverse than the deeper, the deeper sea. Now, it's really hard to study because you need technical diving training. It takes forever to get trained, uh, requires expensive equipment, expensive gases, you have to breathe helium at those depths, so it's not a simple process. Uh, because it requires a lot of training, very few scientists do it. Uh, some scientists do it using a submarine, but my specialty is fishes, and then trying to study fishes on a coral reef with a submarine, it's probably the same as trying to study birds in a rainforest with a helicopter, so it's not the, not the right tool for the job. It's probably okay for invertebrates, for things that don't move a lot, for sponges, gorgonians, corals, you can kind of get close with the submarine, grab samples, but for the fish, it's really, really hard. So we do it by technical diving. If you've been around coconut diving, uh, the dive shop there, you've seen us carrying rebreathers up and down and uh, bailout tanks and everything. So we do it uh, diving with a rebreather next, yes, which is that one. So that's the Hollis Prism 2. It's a very compact unit. Uh, we do use a lot of tanks that you can see that one on the left side of, I think that's, which one of the pink fin divers is this one? It's you, Kylie. <laughs> um, so this tank here on the side is just a bailout tank. So it's in case the rebreather fails. The rebreather is a very complex machine. And uh, when it fails, we, we have the, the tank, but we didn't use any of them not on, the, on this trip. And we always don't use, we almost always never use them. So go to the next one. So that's what uh, how a rebreather <laughs> functions and why it's it's um, one of the safest and more cost-effective ways of diving at those depths. So again, if you're a diver, you know that the deeper you go, the the, the drunker you feel because of the nitrogen. So we can't breathe nitrogen at the depth the depth the depths we dive, which are between 100 and 150 meters depth. It's the narcosis is too high. You can't breathe nitrogen. You can't function at those depths uh, breathing air. Nitrogen is one. Uh, uh, portion of that uh, equation. The other one is oxygen. Oxygen also becomes toxic when you breathe it at depth, uh, below 45, 50 meters if you're sensitive, 60, 70 meters if you're not. Uh, so we have to remove both oxygen and nitrogen, and we breathe helium. But helium is a very, very expensive gas. And at those depths, a normal tank, the one that you can spend 45, 50 minutes at uh, 20 or 30 meters depth, only lasts for about four or five minutes at 120, 130 meters because the, the pressure compresses the gases a lot, so you need a lot more gas to your lungs, so the tanks goes out very quickly. Now, because it goes out very quickly, every breath you take with a tank, every time you exhale, it's 10 or $15 down the drain, in the worst of helium alone, uh, because it's, helium is very expensive these days. So that's one of the reasons why we use the rebreather. So it's actually a relatively simple system. It was invented before not regular scuba, much many years before, if you're curious about how a rebreather works and how all the safety of this operation is done, Maritis is there, you can ask him a million questions after the talk. Uh, but with the rebreather, when you exhale, instead of the bubbles coming out into the, the, into the uh, uh, system, into the environment, they go back into the system. There's a filter on the back that removes the CO2. Then there's three electric electronic sensors that's, that, that detect the amount of oxygen. 
And then you can program your computer to add only the amount of oxygen that you need. And then it adds you, it, it breathes the same gas back. So minus the CO2 plus the oxygen. So you can, as you can see, nothing is happening with the helium there. So we're breathing basically the same helium over and over again, removing the CO2 and adding the oxygen we need. So in a nutshell, in a very simple nutshell, that's how a rebreather works. Now, when we got trained to do the rebreather and we started diving at those depths, one of the first questions we wanted to answer was, are they a refuge? So if you look at the scientific the papers that were written about those deeper reefs, going back to the, the, the 70s and 80s, most scientists believe that those deeper reefs were a refuge for the shallow reef uh, fauna in general, uh, because divers don't have access to it, scientists don't have access to it, so probably humans, human impacts don't get there. So lots and lots of people still have thought that was the case, and it, they thought that was the case based on these two assumptions here. One, that there's a lot of overlap between shallow and deep reefs, and two, that deep reefs are out of reach of humans because it's very hard to get there. Uh, no, stay there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Almost there. Um, yes. So we, after doing, after actually going to those depths and looking at what is there, we saw that none of these two assumptions are right. The first one is based on depth ranges, and depth range is a very coarse measure of where a species is in the ocean. So a lot of fish, a lot of corals, for example, a cropper of Palmata, the elkhorn coral that I think everybody knows here very well, uh, the official depth range of that species is one to 60 meters. When did you ever see an acropora of Palmata, an elkhorn coral deeper than five meters? Like never, right? So if, when you go to the habitat and you look at what is actually there, their depth distribution is very different from what their official depth range is. Now that 60 meter record there for a proper Palmata, it might be there, it might be an actual record of one colony that was found there hundred years ago, or an error that was in a label somewhere and people put it in there. For whatever reason, it is there. So it, it happens over and over again in many, many different species. Their distributions are, their official depth distributions are over uh, uh, what they, the species actually occurs. Something else that is really common in fishes is that fish, they're much more mobile than corals, so they can go move up and down the water column. So there's a lot of fish that only live in, in cold water. So there's some species of chromis here that you only see deeper than 60 meters in Florida or North Carolina. They're much shallower because the water in the shallows is colder. So their depth range is from the shallow to the deep, but that doesn't mean that they occur in both deep and shallow reefs. They only occur in shallow reefs when the shallow reefs are cold. So that species is not a one that uses a refuge. So you can't really assume that species that have that depth range are shallow species that use a refuge. And then as you're gonna see, we're gonna show it in photos and videos, those deep reefs are not out of reach from human impacts. Uh, we know that shallow coral reefs are being impacted by everything from local overfishing to global warming. Deeper reefs are being impacted by many, many of the same, uh, of the same impacts that are reaching the shallow reefs. Should I keep going? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. Oh, no. She's just going to move the top bar. Yeah, I oh, just okay. give me one second. You can go to the next one. Thank you. Oops. Oops. Uh oh. Yeah, there you go. So, this is a dive we did. Like we dove a lot on was, uh, what is it? Burns drop off right in front of the, oh, where the mooring for the uh, aggressor is. So we did two dives there, two dives in the hole in the wall, and then one dive here on the east side. That was the only day we could go because of the weather. So because we visited very few locations, we didn't see a lot of diversity. So, but the, the plan is to keep coming back here and studying more reefs in other areas as we go. We did one dive at the Josie J to the wreck. Um, and the wall there looks very similar to the wall here, which I think is because of the side. Uh, but in the east side, there was a lot of sedimentation. So there's a lot of sediment over the reef. I don't know when it rains, you might get a lot of sediment there that rains down on this, on this reef. And it's not very vertical there. Here, the reef is very, very vertical. We went all the way down at the hole in the wall. We went all the way down to 130 meters and uh, it was vertical all the way down. We looked down and, and there was no bottom. In, uh, uh, at, on the east side, the church wall, the, the reef goes to about, the wall there goes to about 45 meters and then it becomes a slope. And that slope continues all the way down to, we had to swim a lot to get to 120 meters. Here, it's, uh, the reef goes to about 30 meters, then there's a steep slope to about 60. Then there's the other wall that is the, the endless 
well, that we couldn't find an end for it. it. Might have be an end, but it's not within our reach. Probably within the deep sea reach there. Um, so this is a, a, a shot of us coming up from the dive. I think this is about 90, 95 meters depth. There are quite a bit of sponges, but as you can see, like all of the brown here is, is sediment. So there are a lot of sedimentation, but very fine sediment. If you touch it, it just comes up as a cloud. Um, and it's it's very different from the side here you see on the other pictures. So what's the next one? This is the wall at about 50 meters depth. Um, uh, more sponges because there's less effect of the sediments, I think. But I think that side there is less, is more shaded and it gets more nutrients than here. So we found more sponges there and more octocorals, more gorgonians here. So it's very different one side to the other. And I wouldn't doubt that I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a very different set of sponges just between one side of the island to the other, which I'm sure it's the case for the shallow reefs too, because they, they're uh, uh, subjected to the same dynamics. So this is the west side. That's our friend there, the, the lionfish. This is at about 60 meters, so it's 65 meters. It's that first, that second ledge. So there's the, the, the reef, the, the drop off that most people dive on. It kind of drops down to about 30, 35 meters and it becomes a slope. That slope continues to about here and then it goes down. And that's, that becomes just vertical from there. And there's a lot less sediment on this side. I don't know if it's because there's more currents here or maybe it's because the, the reef is further from shore or maybe it's because it's more vertical, but for whatever reason, there's a lot less sediment we saw on this side as opposed to the, as opposed to the east side and then a lot more color too. We didn't see much of that. So the, all of the green that you see here is Alameda, it's a foreign algae. We didn't see much of that on the east side, but the, the, the walls here on this side, they, it's, they're characteristically very rich in, in Halimeda. And a lot of sponges and then a lot of Gorgon, octocorals, uh, Gorgonians and, and so on. This is a little bit deeper. So the, the, the wall, the, the ledge is right there. So then it just becomes this wall. Um, this is at about 80, 85 meters um, at the, the hole in the wall site. That's a really large barrel sponge. Sometimes I have divers in the pictures for scale. Sometimes I don't. This one I happen to not have it. But as you can see, like it's very different from the, the east side with all of the all of the different invertebrates that we see on this side. We saw corals deeper here than we saw on the other side too. So I think this water here is probably consistently more a better visibility than on the other side too. This is even deeper, and uh, I, I have this one because it, it just these holes. It's a, the structure is almost like a, a dead reef. So it's a reef that grew there at some point when the sea level rose, it died, and then it left behind all of the complexity that is colonized by all of the animals that live there now, which are very different than the ones that live here today. So if you think of the the, the shore right there, that uh, really rocky, sharp shore, limestone shore. This is more or less what it looks like, but turned vertically. So think about it like that with the caves and the holes and everything. If you turn that vertically, that's more or less what the wall looks like in terms of complexity and places for animals to hide. So this, because it provides habitat for a lot of fish food, invertebrates, right? It's the joke I have with Terry. Um, then a lot of fish inhabit it, including lionfish. So we saw lionfish in every dive, goes all the way down to 130 meters. Um, there's no, I mean, if anybody has a hope to eradicating it, forget about it. It's not, it's impossible to eradicate. I did some submarine dives in Curaçao too. I saw them all the way down to 300, 400 meters in, in Curaçao. So you can keep their numbers down, but you can't eradicate them anymore. And quite frankly, I think at this point, the Caribbean fish are probably adapted to their presence. So they wouldn't, if they're biologically, they, they're not suffering with their presence anymore. Um, I know that there's still a lot of removal uh, uh, efforts going on. It's it's okay, I guess, uh, better than than taking out the groupers, um, but uh, it's it's not having much of a biological effect anymore. But they're there. They're part of the Caribbean now. They're even in Brazil now. I'm studying it. Uh, they just arrived in Brazil, so now they're having a big impact in Brazil because the Brazilian fish don't know what they are. So they're just arriving there now and causing havoc, especially in the small islands. And I think it's going to be a bigger problem in Brazil as opposed to what it was in the Caribbean, because in Brazil, there's very small, really isolated islands with a lot of endemic species. So if it's a small island with a species that's only there, the population of that species is much smaller than a species that live in the, in the entire Caribbean, which is the case for most Caribbean species. There's very few localized endemics in the Caribbean. Uh, this is the deepest photo I took. That's about 130 meters, that hole in the wall. 
And uh, when I saw it, I was really excited because I thought it was strongest von Beberi, which is a species we describe business specimens we collected in uh, 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 Curaçao, but it's not. It's just an adult of the, the next one, um, that one from his caught eye. So this is, what is it called? The purple reef fish, or I don't know what the common names. I'm really bad with fish common names. I think it's the purple reef fish. It makes very little sense because to me, it looks very blue and not purple. Uh, in reef fish, it's not very distinct, right? But it's the official common name, purple reef fish. Uh, but the juveniles are usually shallow and the, the adults are much, much deeper. Uh, they're harder to see than the juveniles. You have to look for the adults a lot. The, the, the uh, juveniles are usually together with the uh, sunshine guys, which are these that are a little bit shallower even. So these come up to about 25, 30 meters. Sometimes you can find them. So those are your typical upper mesophotic zone kind of fish. They're slightly shallower than what we're going to talk about next which are those guys. So the black cap basslet starts at about 40 meters, but it goes all the way down. When you get to about 80 or 90 meters, it's, it's the dominant species on the reef. So you see more of these than anything else, except but for fish, <laughs> which I think it's, it's seasonal, right? So it comes up and down here. I've never seen this many in my life. It's just an explosion of them everywhere. And we did send them all the way down to 130 meters. They are everywhere. This guy, Neonyphon marianus, is very common. When you get past about 60 meters, you can see them in the shallows too, but rarely in the past 60 meters, it's the most common. Every hole you see one of them. It's the most common squirrel fish by far in the deep, uh, in the deep reef. I got both of them. This guy, a, a juvenile of these, and uh, a juvenile of a, a, or a small crumb of malacara, the black cap bass in, in lionfish stomachs before. So that's what the lionfish are eating in the deeper, yeah, in the deeper waters. That's a, a, a goby that lives in sponges and doesn't clean, and you can't really see it. I haven't seen any in the shallow reefs here, only in the deep reefs. That's a Wakatani Glowizi. And I think the shallowest I've seen it is about 50 meters, but they, when you get past 50 meters, almost every sponge, there's five or six of them. Uh, Carex lubris, blackjack, uh, that one you can fish quite easily around here, probably, because they're common in deep reef, but you can't really see them shallow. Unless you're diving this time of the day, they come up shallow to hunt, but it's, it's very rarely that you see them shallow, but we saw them in almost every dive. If we turn around and look around, they always like the light because it startles the fish, so they come and get the fish. And this is kind of shows you more of the structure of the reef that's looking down from about 100 meters. That's one that I don't think anybody in this room has seen before. That's Serenus lucipertanus, and this one I think the shallowest we've seen it is about 90, 95 meters depth. This photo I took at about 120 meters depth. Uh, it was on this side, on uh, rolling the wall, but we saw it on both sides of the island. So it's a species that is at the depth that they are, they're fairly common. We see the five or six or 10 of them in like the two minutes that we spent at those depths. This one, uh, uh, Lipogramma clay, uh, it's a really spectacularly looking fish, but it's tiny. It's, this small, very, very small. So I had a really hard time taking this picture. We came here uh, a few months ago in October of last year to do dive training. I, I took my camera and in the few dives that I did with the camera, I tried many, many times to photograph this species and I couldn't get a good photo of it. So I'm really glad that this time I got a good photo of it. But this one is about 85 meters. So between six, 70 and 90 to 100 meters, this is one of the most common fish that you see. Uh, that's uh, one of the common gobies here, Antilogobius nikii. Uh, below 80 meters, you see them in schools that move constantly from one way, one place to another. And I didn't get any photos of it the last trip. This trip I got this good one, so really nice. There's not many photos of this species around, mostly because it's it's very hard to get to and very deep. Yeah, and that guy that we saw everywhere. From the surface to about 130 meters. Uh, the, the deepest points we were, both sides, they're just about everywhere. I don't understand this. I mean, the fifth, even the, the, the official depth range of this species is one to 90 meters, right? It doesn't go to 100, it's not supposed to go to 130 meters. So we can write a paper extending the depth range of this guy because we saw it at 130 meters. So they're just about everywhere. I think the next one is the invertebrates. So I'm going to pass it on to Terry to talk a little bit about our. Invertebrate findings. Thank you. Thanks very much, Luis. Well, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about invertebrates because most of you have seen a lot of these shallow water invertebrates and you know them well. And um, 
one of the things that I think is particularly important is when you look at the health of reefs, one of the easiest judges that people use is how healthy are the corals? And that's by and large what everybody uses, but they don't look at the always the health of the ecosystem and the complexity of the relationships of the different species. For example, that commensal shrimp on the left that you've all photographed and it's just so um, striking. One of the things that that indicates is a healthy symbiotic relationship. If you don't have that anemone, you're not gonna have the shrimp. So these things are dependent on each other and one of the things that really characterizes coral reefs and their diversity is the interdependence of species. You don't have complex relationships where a specific species usually lives on another one in temperate ecosystems, nearly to the degree that you have this complexity of symbiosis um, on coral reefs. So, one of the things that I'm always looking for is, are those relationships there? Do you find the indicators of those healthy ecosystems? And one of the things that I can say by and large is that the sponges on the slope down to 30 meters, which is as far as I went on in my diving. <laughs> these guys think that's pretty funny, but <laughs> I enjoy it <laughs> immensely. And you have a lot more time to spend. They have they get to look at this habitat a lot more than I do because they're decompressing in that habitat. So they actually have more bottom time. Um, but but I think all of the the walls and slopes have an abundance of growth of, and high diversity of, of different sponge species of different um, octocorals, gorgonians. Um, and all of those things are zoned just like in the mesophotic. So you find things, you find sponge species, as I'm sure you've seen when you get to the bottom, the first bottom of the wall at 30 meters, and then you work your way up, and then you find that there's a whole array of other different invertebrates that, that really take over. So we're looking not only at those symbiotic relationships, but whether those ecosystems are intact and you have the well-developed zonation um, that is indicative of a healthy reef. And I would say by and large, everything that we saw were good indicators of, of very healthy reef ecosystems. Next slide. And of course, one of the things that I'm looking for is nudibranch. And this is a very specialized nudibranch and thanks to Tina, I was able to see this for the first time. But this is living exclusively on the upside down jellyfish. It's a predator um, and it incorporates the stinging cells from the upside down jellyfish into the tips of these structures um, all, all along its body. And it can store those stinging cells in specialized sacs and use them for its own defense. So it's called kleptonidae. It's stealing the stinging cells from, from its prey. So it's not only getting nutrition from the jelly, it's also getting protection. So it's, it's really uh, double dipping in terms of its um, biological interactions with the species. And one of the things that I was really curious to see is that there's another common species of um, of this genus Dondise in the Caribbean that is much more colorful. And only recently people have looked at the molecular studies and found that the one that is found exclusively on the upside down jellyfish is genetically distinct from the one that you find on hydrides up on, uh, like on pier pilings and places like that. So we're still learning a lot about diversity, not necessarily discovering something that is a new species that we know right away is a new species. But when we look at the genetic differences and the ecological differences that follow those, we find that there's a lot more diversity than we 
previously imagined. And we now have genetic tools of sequencing the DNA so that we can really study these things in detail and learn a lot more about them. So this is a really good example of that. Next. And of course, this is the lettuce sea slug, the most common um, sea slug that you find here. And again, Tina and I were partnered on looking for these things. I've been looking for them on the reefs for four days. And of course, we found them on the pier pilings right at the dock in front of the coconut tree dive <laughs> operation. So um, snorkeling, you can find a lot of things as well. Next to There. And, and then I just put this in um, this picture of Oriaster, the Caribbean star, which is an inhabitant of sandy habitats. And one of the things that we often forget about when we're studying coral reefs is that, that sandy habitats, um, this was at, at um, Big Bite, um, which is a beautiful, pristine lagoon system. There's well developed turtle grass flats. There are sandy patches where they're, they're their own unique species. We were diving um, for about an hour and a half um, in our maximum depth was 14 feet. Um, this guy thinks that's pretty funny yet again. Um, but it was beautiful, pristine, um, well-developed ecosystems that are in very healthy condition. And all of these ecosystems are interdependent on each other. So the shallow reef ecosystems from the mangroves through the turtle grass flats to the sand patches to the coral reef itself, and then dropping down into the mesopodic, all of these things are interdependent with each other. And um, you also know that what goes on on land in um, the amount of deforestation, the amount of sediment going into the um, lagoons and into the reef ecosystem. All of these things are fundamentally interconnected and they're, they're interactions that take place as a result of all of the activities that we as humans engage in. And so we just need to be really cognizant of how we manage the whole ecosystem from the mountaintop down to the, the mesophotic and into the deep sea beyond the mesophotic. And I think I'll end it right there and turn it back to Mark. Okay, just to wrap it up, I, I wanted to point this out. We got Moridius there, he's laughing. It's <laughs> this famous picture of him and he's doing this. Um, but we, we have this museum in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco and, and a centerpiece of our museum is this tank. It's the Philippine Coral Reef Tank. It's focused on, on uh, work in the Philippines that largely has been led by Terry going back to the 1990s. And, and it's a great example of how we can take the scientific work and the the community partnerships and the collaboration that we develop and then translate that into a guest facing attraction that we'll see more than a million people a year, right? So our pre-COVID, uh, we would see one to one and a half million people a year through our museum. Um, so it's an amazing way to connect with an audience. And we've started to do that uh, with the, this work with the Mesophotic uh, in, with an exhibit that we opened in uh, 2016 called the Twilight Zone, Deep Reefs Revealed. And so we've actually gone to places and collected fish and brought them back and, and we display them and try and show people about these uh, unexplored and unknown, mostly unknown habitats. All right, and so th this is a video. So um, I'm not, I don't wanna narrate the whole thing because that would no, be it's annoying. Been minutes. Kind of yeah, so let's just, um, just press it one more time and it should play. But this just shows some of the um, of the shots that we that we took on this trip, and uh, the distinction again is what, as Louise talked a little bit about between that upper mesophotic and the lower mesophotic. And think we can open up for questions in the video. What do you think? Yeah. Questions. Anybody has any questions? Go ahead, Doug. I, so 
I'm curious about the puffers. <laughs> because if you're there, see, there, this is at about uh, maybe you know, 90 meters. That big school of things that you saw with those tiny little bogies and the, 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 the puffers are there. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody in Roatan is going crazy, right? Because they're all dying. Yeah. Um, is that something that normally happens with them? Is this like a seasonal thing, or you know, why why is it? Or do you have any idea? So we talked to a few people about it, and they said they've seen this before in Roatan multiple years. Um, I've seen it in Mexico one year. They the poles. I can tell you that nowhere in the Caribbean they are naturally this abundant. So this was probably a wave of, of recruits that arrived here and, and settled and, and <coughs> created this population explosion. And they're probably dying naturally now because there's not enough food. They're, they're fighting too much with, with each other or, yeah, sorry. Um, they're probably fighting too much with each other. There's not enough food. I think they're dying now naturally um, because there's too many of them. But we're studying it. Chance is in the audience there in the back. He's he's collecting data about their abundance and their aggressive interactions, and we're probably gonna write a paper about it at some point. Yeah. Um, I just haven't been believed as well. Right. Except whether it's the same because of influxes and learning that have I've gotten them in the stomachs of snappers at about five or three months. Yeah. And then when they die, they sink. Yeah. Right. Around the same time, and then die off, right? Yeah, exactly. I haven't seen it elsewhere outside of, I haven't heard about it outside of the Western Caribbean. Yeah. I don't know if the same thing happens in the, in the, it's not until. Every, it's not every single year, but it's, right. Yeah, it's like every two, three years. But right. Year. But it's interesting. And um, there's one, at least one species in the Pacific that that happens to also. I just do yeah. that's the deepest I saw of stony coral. So this is, that's Agaricia, and this is at 295 feet. So. 90 meters more or less, yeah, give or take. So this is, yeah, how the structure looks like. That's the, the lower mesophobic zone. Black corals, wire corals, and this white thing here is probably a sponge. Another question. Yeah. Just if they're propagation, are they overturned on the website or? Yes, yes. Um, there is a year. That's the stickers. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the sticker there, there's a, a QR code that takes you to our website. And most of the publications that we link there are open. If you find one that it's not, you can email any one of us and we'll send you the, the PDF. But you can use the hashtag, I can have PDF. <laughs> don't buy it. Don't buy the paper, whatever you do. Yeah. Don't pay the publishers more money than what they already get. Yeah. <laughs> Right. The sites just kind of blown up. Right. It's just seen, it seems like there's deterioration. So that was a communication for the last five years. So yeah. I'm curious if you can talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sad everywhere we go. And we go, we travel a lot doing this through Hope for Reefs initiative. That's one of, one of the trips that really hit us really hard was a trip we did just before COVID to Tahiti. We went uh, to collect. Uh, specimens and then we came back six weeks later and the reef was bleaching so i had seen the the result the end result of bleaching many many times i've seen that reef but i hadn't seen a dying reef to that point and it was really really depressing but uh it's it's deteriorating really really quickly we didn't see any pillar coral and we spent three hours in, in some shallow reefs so we didn't see any of them alive um so it's it's really concerning i think um just not to end it in a completely negative note, I think that uh, reefs as an ecosystem are going to survive. Some species are not dying. And so it's usually reefs and ecosystems in general, they go through this cycle, they get destroyed and then they rebuild. So I think they're gonna come back. The humans are not gonna be the end of coral reefs like you see through the headlines, but it's coral reefs in 50 years are gonna be very, very different than they are today, for sure. But we've seen there's, yeah, there you go. We've seen destruction and impacts all the way down to 130 meters. Yeah, there's a fishing, there's a lot of fishing line in this. Yeah, that's a fishing line there. Uh, there's a lot of fishing lines in this side. And you can see that it, it looks like the like fishing line, it looks like the, the limestone that you see here in the surface just put vertically so that the, the, the holes are facing 
sideways, not up. But it, yeah, all fishing lines. Some of the fishing lines have been there for a long time, so sponges take a while to grow. Do you want to narrate that part, Bart? You put together the painting. Um, <laughs> There's a question in the chat. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, they yeah. just wanted to know if you traditionally open or not. There you go. Oh. Yes, the answer is open. We are open. Yes. This is a plastic. Yeah, plastic yeah so this was a bottle. plastic bottle that's tucked back into a little crack in 100 meters. The structure is amazing, right? The complexity of it and all the holes. And, and it, it looks very barren, but when you, when you look up close, there are lots of little tiny encrusting corals and <laughs> organisms in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're everywhere. Everyone, every video. It's like, where's Waldo? Yeah. And then I think the plastic bottles are associated with the fishing line for some reason. Because there, there were several of them that were like, yeah, like a buoy kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. I was just, at what point did the scratch become harvesting? Yeah. Like, when, when you stop from the picnic? Before? Yeah. Well, I mean, who's going to remove that, right? Not to see grass up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you'll see here this, um, the, the next sort of clips, there's some ropes that have obviously been down there for decades. There these huge sponges growing on. I mean, I wouldn't have to remove those at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to let somebody else answer that question. <laughs> yeah, part of it. I'll take part of it. Yeah. yeah, that's the rope with all this. See the size of the yeah. One of the things we really try and do is collect only when necessary. and when there's a really important scientific question that we're trying to answer, where you really have to have um, a bit of a specimen, sometimes you can only take, you only need to take a small piece. In the case of small organisms, you sometimes have to sacrifice one. But um, one of the things you really need, for example, I mentioned those two species of nudibranch. If you didn't know they were two different species, you would manage that species very differently. So you have to have knowledge to really understand what is the most effective way to um, preserve that ecosystem. And um, if we didn't know what species provided all of this composition, we need to have specimens and we need to know, have those specimens historically so that we can go back and look at specimens that were collected from the 1800s and say, this is what was in that reef 100 years ago or 150 years ago, because reefs are going through a bottleneck. And so we need to know what are we comparing it to? Because if you only compared it to what you saw last year or 10 years ago, you really wouldn't have a good understanding of which, what the target is to try and restore that ecosystem and regenerate the, the species that are in that habitat. And so. That's the primary reason for collecting. We never um, are collecting specimens of endangered species. Um, we are only collecting um, new species and species where we're trying to answer those questions. And the reason we have to have a, um, a new species, you can't name a species without a specimen. You have to have a specimen that people can go back and verify that that is indeed what that species is. And that's called a type specimen, and so it requires that. So we're very selective about what we collect. We're answering a specific question, not just trying to take everything that we see from that reef. And, and I, I did the spreadsheet of the specimens that we collected over the last two weeks, and there's like 15 specimens total. So that gives you an idea of, of the intensity of the collecting that we do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, for the community ecology work that I mentioned, that we, we are comparing the shallow and deep reefs, um, we do transects. So we do transect counts. We do shorter transects than the standard transect because we do them all the way down to the bottom and we can't spend more than 10 minutes doing a transect. So our transects are only 20 meters long. 
and we count one every fish one meter to each side and then we do that repeatedly to as many depths as we can and then we compare everything uh we've been doing this all over the place we did uh we didn't do it here this time because the main person that does it puts on pinheiro he's a, a brazilian colleague of ours he couldn't come this time but uh chance is in the back there he's looking at he does all of the statistics in it. So he, his computer never stops. It's like a, a, a R machine that, that runs 24 seven and melts every, everything we put in there. Yeah. Um, I just have a question about like selection at depth. Yeah. Do you have to do anything to make sure that the fish, like the conditions for the fish, they constant like the temperature? Yeah, so I don't because I might at the collection that I take care of is the specimen collection like Terry. So all of our fish are preserved in jars and in formalin and they don't, I don't need them to, to stay happy, but yeah. Bart does. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one that keeps the fish alive. Yeah, it's a whole different ballgame when you have to keep things alive. Yeah. And, and so we've worked on this for many years, um, you know, really going back to Vanuatu, like 2014, yeah. 15, maybe. Um, we started trying to figure out how do you bring fish back from this these mesophytic reefs alive and, and hold them in the aquarium and um, it's tricky and so we actually invented a portable submersible fish decompression chamber um, that is about the size of a scuba cylinder it's made from a like a canister filter like you might put on your drinking water on your house to remove so it's that hard plastic body with the screw on lid because um, it was a sort of ready-made object that was cheap and then you know we could mo we modified that and we built a special sleeve for the inside of it that's like a jar that you could collect with so we collect with nets catch the fish you put it inside that jar and then when you get to a shallower stop um, maybe 60 meters 65 70 meters and um, we stop and we we put that jar inside the pressure canister and we blow a bubble in the lid and we seal it up. And that bubble is follows Boyle's law. And as you come up to the surface, it expands and then it holds the pressure constant in that chamber. Uh, and so it, it, it's basically, you can bring, you know, like eight liters of the twilight zone with you wherever you want to go. Those fish are still at, you know, 75 meters of pressure or something like that. Um, we can then hook it up to a pump uh, submersible pump and run water through it and we can keep the fish in there for as long as we want we can feed them in there we can do whatever we want uh, and then uh, slowly decompress them over the course of like three days and then they're at ambient pressure and they live on the surface um, so we actually got a patent for that and so I'm <laughs> Luis and I and like four or three or four other people that worked on this are United States patent holders for a submersible fish decompression chamber, um, which was I, like one of my proudest moments in life for sure. <laughs> uh, but once we get them back to the aquarium, we only have to control really for two things. We control for the temperature because they're found the water where we're found is cooler. Uh, and we control for the light because they're used to mesophotic middle light, sort of dimmer, bluer light. And so we control for those, but they behave just like every other fish. They eat like every other fish and you know, what they need to do. This is our team that is here with us uh, on this trip. So it's a pretty good sized team. And thanks to everybody uh, who came tonight to see the talk and to the Boatan Marine Park and Coconut Key Divers for all the support over the past couple of weeks. It's been a good trip. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Luis, Terry, and Bart for the amazing talk. I hope that everyone learned about the Mesoporic Zone in Roatan. And I hope that you come back soon to Roatan. Thank you all.